Yeah, so let me recall what, um, what we discussed uh, last time. So last time, last time I looked at the so-called implicit limit. And um, so the idea was to start from Navier-Stokes with the viscosity nu. So basically we had an equation of this type. with divergence free condition and u at time zero is some u zero of x. And the important thing was the boundary condition. And um, so if I, if I just simplify the problem and look at the problem in the half space, for instance, so my omega, let's say my omega will be um, r plus 3. So r3 plus, so just the upper half place, uh, upper, upper half space. Then um, this will be the natural problem, the Dirichlet boundary condition. And um, so I explained last time that uh, understanding this limit when nu goes to zero uh, is an open problem, right, with this boundary condition, right? So it's an open problem to prove. So if I, if I call this solution uh, u nu, because they depend on the viscosity nu, So it's an open problem to understand the limit of u nu when u goes to when u goes to zero, right? Even in the in the interior of the domain, right? Even in the interior of the domain. Okay. So so the reason the reason is that okay. So the, the, tr the idea, I mean, the idea is to say, okay, I have, I have energy estimates. You can say, okay, I have energy estimate that tells me that U of T L2 square plus the integral of the viscosity let's say less than a constant coming from the initial data. This will be the initial data. So this is the uniform bound you have. Um, now this uniform bound, if you want to use compactness method, if you want to use some compactness method, um, all you can deduce is that by compactness, All what you can say is that u nu will converge weakly to some to some u zero when u goes to zero. Let's say in uh, in L two L two, right? Because you have this bound. I mean, locally in time. Locally in time, right? And it's not a problem of long time. I mean, like you just take small time. But then if you have this weak convergence, uh, you cannot pass to the limit in the nonlinear term. And it's not a question about being in the interior or not in the interior. Now, the qu your question about the interior is related to the fact to say, oh, let me try to prove higher regularity. If I have higher regularity, then maybe I can do something. But now, if you try to prove higher regularity, for fixed viscosity, yes. I mean, for Navier-Stokes, we, we know how to propagate higher regularity. 
Now, if you are in three dimensions, if you are in three dimensions and you want to propagate higher regularity, maybe the time of existence will depend on the viscosity and can shrink with the viscosity. If you are in two dimensions, you can prove uh, global existence for Navier-Stokes even with high regularity, but you don't have uniform bounds, right? Meaning that this is the energy, so this is energy. So the energy gives me something which is uniform. Um, so if you try to prove higher regularity, if you try to prove higher regularity, I mean you can, but then depending on wh which dimension, if you are in three dimensions, um, you will only be able to prove it for uh, so higher regularity. on a time, uh, higher regularity on uh, or in some interval, 0 t nu. Okay. So you can prove higher regularity on an interval like this, but then the interval can shrink in three dimensions. But it's not, it's th that's not really the issue because even in 2D, we can prove higher regularity, same thing. But let's say if I want to prove that, if I want to prove some bound in some HS space on, um, on some fixed interval, so I say I can fix my time one, for instance. Uh, I can put till one. I mean, this is something you can prove. But then you get a constant that depends on you. This you can, you can do this. Okay. But then this is useless to, this is useless to, to do any compactness method. So, so the only way, the only way you can try to prove something is by trying to find the corrector or uh, okay um, so so now let's try to um, let me Any more questions about this? So, so basically, um, before, before I go to Prentol, I want to mention few, um, I would say, regularizing uh, effects that will allow you to prove that the limit takes place. So, so this is open, as I mentioned, but um, so I will call other favorable situations. So there are situations where things are favorable and last time we mentioned one of them. Uh, one of them is if I replace new Laplacian by new with imposing that all imposing that this also goes to zero. So this will be a good a good situation. The other good situation is if I replace the boundary condition by Navier. Um, I didn't really go into uh, explaining it precisely, um, but this is actually turns out to be a, a favorable condition. So, 
So another, another case is so-called rotating fluids. Um, the fo uh, I'll explain it. The fourth case is some MHD models. Um, all these are cases where, okay, uh, they can be somehow some regularizing effects. These are, I will call them like more like regularizing effect that can, uh, in a sense, change a little bit the type of boundary layer equation that we have. So they, they can help. Uh, the case of rotating fluids, for instance, is the case you take, you add here, you add here a term like this. Uh, let's say, so since I am in the half space, you put E3 So that's the cross product, okay? So a term like that, um, a term like that, if you add it to your equation, um, the energy is the same because this this is a term that just makes things turn. So it doesn't it doesn't change anything to the energy, um, but it but somehow. Um, Instead of getting the parental boundary layer that I'm going now to explain, it gives you some other type of boundary layer, which is like a so-called Ekman boundary layer. And um, it turns out in that case, you can perform the limit. Of course, now, the limit will not be just Euler, will be an, uh, some, it will be actually in this case, it will be 2D Euler. Because that term will somehow will kill um, the Z dependence. Okay, usually when we consider this problem, the problem... Um, it would be uh, epsilon going to zero and... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So there is a theorem. There's a theorem. Uh, it's not epsilon. Yeah, yeah, epsilon and nu. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I, I, um, so, so actually I have a theorem from... 98 exactly also where epsilon is equal to nu you take in in that problem exactly you take epsilon equal nu uh, usually when we look at the th that problem we look at it um, between two plates so the domain omega will be the torus times zero one let's say Okay, so it's periodic in these directions, in x and y, and in z it is between 0 and 1. You take this, um, then, then you can study the limit, then you can study the limit, and somehow you prove that you converge to, uh, you prove that you converge to Euler. Actually, it's not exactly Euler, it's Euler with some small damping. So there is a damping coming from, from the boundary, from a boundary layer. So here, um, the convergence takes place, but at least the convergence takes place. Like u nu, you can prove that u nu will convert to u0. u0 solves uh, 2D Euler with dumping. Okay. But again, I mean this is rotation is a favorable rotation is a favorable effect that in a sense we call that stabilizes the boundary layer. In that case, I mean it changes actually the boundary layer because like the main the I, I'm going now to explain the derivation of, uh, of the parental boundary layer, but when you add this term, uh, 
somehow the boundary layer changes. The, the main terms in your construction change. So that's one, one good effect. Um, the other good effect, for instance, is some MHD models. I'm not going, I mean, I was planning to talk a little bit about it, but maybe I will, I will not. But I mean, like you can couple your Navier-Stokes equation with an equation to the, for the magnetic field. And there are many models for that. And um, I mean, depending on what type of boundary condition you put, the, um, the coupling has, has some regularizing effect. I mean, can stabilize the boundary layer and so on. I mean, there is a whole literature about uh, about MHD models. Okay, so um, let's now discuss a little bit the derivation of uh, Prandtl. Okay, so now we talk about derivation of Prandtl. So, so okay, I mean this is a little bit related to your uh, your question, uh, Frank. So. Um, I mean, you look at this equation. So, so now let's forget about the let's forget about the rotation. Um, I mean, a natural thing to th to say. Natural thing to say is to say, okay, um, the viscosity should not be important in the interior. So here we should have Euler. And maybe there is a small region here where viscous effects are important. Right? This is very makes a lot of sense to, to think that. And um, here in this region, you will try to match the data of Euler to zero, right? This region will try to match the data. So you have the data of Euler here. You want to match this data of Euler to zero, okay? So So what should, we, what should we do here? So um, the question is, what is the size of this? Okay. So of course, now if, we, if you remember what we said about Cato, Cato says that if in a region of size nu, there's no dissipation, then things are okay. Um, actually, actually, the size here the way you should think about it is you say, okay, I want this term to be, let's say, of the same size as this. And also same size of, as this. So then the natural size is square root of nu, right? So the natural size here is square root of nu. So then, okay, so I'm going to make, so I start with uh, my variables x, y, and then I'm going to make the change of variable. I keep x, but I introduce capital, okay, so I'll call it also capital X, small x, and capital Y will be small y over square root of y. Square root of nu. Okay. So yeah, let's do it in 2D. I mean, the, the, the derivation is the same, but we'll do it in 2D. Okay, so now my, my, uh, my velocity, uv, Okay, so so uh, so my u nu, I will write it 
the vector u nu, I write it as two component u and v. And I will call, I will take capital U, capital U of will be my small u of xy. And then v So um, what should I write here? So remember that I have the divergence free condition. Okay, so the divergence free condition tells me that ux plus vy equals zero. Like for Navier-Stokes. For for um, I would like that you I, I would like to keep this. I would like that u capital X plus v capital Y equals zero, right? These are derivatives. This is the derivative of u. I want, I want this to, to be kept, okay? So then what should I put for capital V? So I want this to be, but I need to multiply it by something here in front. One over? Are you sure it's one over? It's the reverse. I always mix up, so okay, we have to be careful here. I think, yeah, that's. That's uh, that's the thing. Okay, um, we'll check. Okay, now. Okay, now um, we take the, our equation and uh, we just write down what we get. So we get dt capital U. Um, now the U grad U, so let me write it like this. So U grad U, so this will be uh, normally U dx U plus v dy u. Okay, so how does this change? This becomes capital U d capital S u plus the v. The v is what is square root of nu capital v and the dy the dy is 1 over square root of nu t capital Y u. OK? OK, so we always keep in mind that d over dy Make sense? Okay, so it's exactly u dx u plus v dy u. Okay, so
Now the viscosity, I will keep minus nu d2x minus d2 capital Y plus the pressure d capital X of P. So this is the equation, right? Now, the pressure, um, okay, let, let's, uh, let me keep it like this as well. Huh? Okay. Right? Makes sense? Okay, now let's write down the equation for the second component. So I get dt, the, the v becomes square root of nu capital V. Um, I mean, then it's the same. The terms here are the same. That's what we get. Okay, now, um, now we, what we do, we do like uh, asymptotics. So at leading order, at leading order, the second equation becomes what? At leading order, the second equation, this is the main term. Because this has a square root of nu in front. So um, this formally, this will tell us that d capital Y P is zero. Okay. Okay. So then, actually, the this equation that's all what we get from that equation. So I can I can just I can just remove these terms. And that's it. Okay. What do I get finally? I get this equation with this guy that only depends on x, doesn't depend on p. And they have this equation. Now, of course, the v, how do I recover v? I recover v from the incompressibility condition, right? So, um, Right, so the, the, the other thing is that V and U both vanish at the boundary. Both U and V vanish at the boundary. So V is just the integral between zero and capital Y of minus UX dy prime. Okay. Okay, so as of now, as of now, I didn't talk about Euler. As of now, I didn't talk about Euler, okay? Um, I just wrote, I just wrote, I just wrote the leading order term, uh, the leading order equation here. That's all I did, okay? And I dropped, I dropped that uh, time derivative in v. Oh, you don't drop uh, the last uh, uh, the Oh, this one? Yeah, this one we drop it also. That's, yeah, this one I drop it. So, I still need one thing. I still need, um, I still need to understand what happens when capital Y goes to infinity, right? So, um,
Now, capital Y goes to infinity, actually, it's a little bit, uh, it, it seems a little bit counterintuitive, but capital Y goes to infinity, that normally corresponds to small y equals zero. It corresponds to the boundary uh, effect of Euler, right? So, so here, here, so this is the size of my, um, my layer. Capital Y goes to infinity is, is the top of the layer, but that corresponds to what happened to Euler at zero, okay? So, so then that's what we do. Le let's look at the limit capital Y goes to infinity um, here. So we say that U I want this to go to the solution of Euler. So okay. That's really the matching uh, asymptotics. That's the matching. Um, okay, so that's that's all. And actually Actually, th so now this, this in a sense determines, this in a sense determines what should be, um, what should be the pressure. Okay, so this determines what should be the pressure because the pressure we should have here actually should correspond to the, to the pressure of Euler. Okay, so the pressure we have here should correspond to the pressure of Euler. Um, so, um, to simplify things, okay, well maybe I don't need to, to simplify it, but so, um, so basically what you, the, the, the way you can compute the pressure is that you take this guy and you say that that, that will be your equation for Euler. Uh, these terms they drop and what you end up with is the fact that if I keep the I mean, this, this corresponds to taking the equation and sending y to infinity, right? I can send y to infinity in this equation, and um, that, that, that the equation that you get for the pressure. You assume that uh, you, uh, when you send y to infinity, you have some kind of limit at the form of right? And you are just taking the limit. Y yeah, yes. I mean, I mean, the whole the whole thing is really based on the idea of, I mean, this formal idea about matching asymptotics. So, so somehow you are you are saying that, um, I mean, in a sense, you are saying that if you take a region much bigger than square root of nu, so if you take a region much bigger than square root of nu, but still, but still small that region will correspond, so, so if I take a region like new to the power one quarter, right? So if I take a region new to the power one quarter, here, small y will be like new to the one quarter, big y will be new to the minus one quarter, right? So the limit capital Y going to, to infinity will still correspond to small y going to zero in Euler. And then you match. You say, okay, this, uh, this solution should correspond to the Euler solution. And then, um, and then the Euler solution, 
the Euler solution, you can just take the tray. I mean, th there are two ways of trying to determine the pressure. Either you say, okay, let me take the trace of the Euler solution, right? Uh, okay, so this is actually the, the, the first component of the Euler solution. Normally, the Euler solution has, uh, an, uh, has also a VE, but the VE vanishes at the boundary. Right, so if I took, if I take my Euler solution, uh, this is fine. Huh? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so basically, usually when we look at Prandtl, um, when when we look at Prandtl, we even simplify more because most of the times we'll take this to be a constant. Right. So what many times we call uh, Constant or just depends on x, either constant or just depends on x. Usually we, we, we try to drop this uh, time dependence here. Um, okay, so this is the equation then. So I should add to it, for instance. Hmm? If you take a UE constant, then at the end the pressure is also constant, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, right, so constant, right, so if I take, so there are different cases. I can take, I can take U Euler to be constant depending on any, I mean U Euler of T, uh, Tx0 to be a constant, so in which case there's no pressure, the pressure will be zero. Or the, some other cases are, let's say, some linear dependence or some, or some, some just ue of x, in which case you get the pressure, right? But somehow the difficulties are the same. So um, you can, if you want to simplify things, you say, okay, let me take it to be zero, and then it simplifies. So you don't have either, even the pressure. Um, okay. So this is the derivation. So I, I, I said, okay, we add to it. U goes when y goes to infinity to, uh, to all that. Okay, let me write it like this. So we have, um, and this, this I can forget because for me the pressure is just a function of x. So okay, so I have this equation with, um, with also u equal to zero at y equals zero. So I have u at zero, I have u at infinity, I have v that I compute by, from the incompressibility. So this is how I compute V. And I have this equation on U. Okay. So, I mean, when you look at it, I mean, it seems, it's a, it's a scalar equation. It's, I mean, you can think that, okay, I mean, this, this should be a good, uh, this should be a good uh, equation. Um, so what are the difficulties? What's the problem with this? Um, so the problem, the main problem is actually coming from, from this derivative. This derivative is a loss of derivative, it's a loss. There's a loss of a derivative. So this term has a loss of derivative. Of course now, it's similar to this guy. This guy also has a loss of derivative, but this term is a transport. This is transport. So we know how to deal with transport. When you have a loss of derivative in a transport term, that's a good term. I mean, you do energy, high order energy estimates will still, will, will work. Uh, this one, not. High order energy estimate will not work. Okay, so, um, Uh, 
Now, energy. So, um, yeah, so, so, so let, me, let me forget about the pressure first. Let's forget about this. Just think that this is a constant. Not necessarily zero, but a constant, let's say, one. Oh. So then you can, you, can write, you can multiply by u, integrate by parts, and you can get the fact that the integral u squared over 2 plus, if you multiply by u, integrate by parts, this term will disappear. So, so you can even get um, an equation of this type. Um, so here I'm integrating in x, y. equals zero, right? And then I can integrate, so I, I can get, I can get some energy, right? Um. Oh, oh, okay, you assume there's a constant, uh, okay, because... It, yeah, I mean like, okay, I mean, yeah, yeah, so there's uh, s something wrong with what I'm writing here. Okay. There's something wrong. I mean, what I am writing will work if this constant is zero. And if I take, uh, um, but just very formal. Okay. Yeah, so, so assume here the constant is zero. Okay. Uh, if the constant is not zero, okay, you have to subtract something, but then uh, you have to subtract something that corresponds to what happens at infinity. But, but basically you can, you can prove something like that. Uh, now, if you want to go to higher regularity, it turns out that there is, there is a quantity which is good, which is when you take a derivative in y. If I take this equation and differentiate it in y, um, I can introduce what we call omega, the vorticity. So then it will satisfy the same equation. And actually, omega will um, will will go to zero at infinity because because this uh, this has a limit, so the derivative will go to zero. Um, so you can write down you can write down also some something similar. Um, but the problem is x derivatives. So y derivatives are, are fine. The problem is that now if I want to, to take an x derivative, what happens if I want to do an x derivative of this, um, of the equation? So if I take an x derivative, I get the following equation. So these are the good terms, but I have plus So this term is fine. I mean, it's fixed. It's coming from the Euler equation. It's not a problem. This is transport. This term is, is OK. It doesn't lose derivatives. But it's this guy that loses derivatives. This term loses derivatives, right? Because you have Vx. Vx is like two derivatives on u, right? So it's this, term, this term is like dy minus 1 of uxx. Um, 
And okay, you don't know what to do with it. You don't know what to do with it. It loses a derivative, right? It loses a derivative. So if you are losing derivatives, it seems the only way you can solve is by, by using uh, cauchy kovalevsky and uh, taking analytic initial data, okay? And if you, are, if you have situations where you have, I mean, this is similar to trying to solve, for instance, um, if you try to solve an equation like this, dTU plus uh, some function of ux equals zero. I mean, if you have equations of this type, usually you can solve them in analytic regularity, right? I mean, just think about, just think about this, for instance, um, minus du equals zero. Right, if you take an equation like this, d is like a derivative. An equation like this, you can always only solve in analytic regularity, right? And yeah, so then it's true, like a Prandtl, we can solve it in analytic regularity, and there are many papers dealing with that, and um, one of the main, one of the main works on this is a work by Kaflish and San Martino. Um, around 98, who, who studied the problem, um, who studied the problem in analytic regularity. They also studied the inviscid limit. They also do the inviscid limit in analytic regularity, and they just even justify the boundary layer. So it's, it's, it's a quite important work, plus inviscid limit. Plus inviscid limit in analytic regularity. Um, their work, in their work, they are using, they are assuming analyticity in both X and Y. They are assuming analyticity in both X and Y. Uh, but from, from the formal argument I'm showing here, uh, I mean, we are only losing in X. So it's not really necessary that what one puts uh, analyticity in Y. And actually, that was removed later on. So there are works of uh, San Martino with some other collaborators and also more recent, some work of uh, Vlad Vikol with uh, uh, Igor Kokavika, also um, studying the Prandtl without, uh, only with analytic regularity in X. So it's analytic regularity in X, but Sobolev in Y. But we cannot do the inviscid limit in that case. Um, so, uh, we call so here analytic in X and Sobolev in Y. So, so somehow, like these results, what are the difficulties? What, 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 what are the problems? The problem is more or less how you deal with the decay in Y, right? I mean, we understand more or less what's happening in X. Okay, you have a loss of derivative. So if you put analyticity in X, you, you, are, you are fine. But then you have to, you have to, put the right weight in Y, the right weight in Y. That's, that's really the difficulties here because uh, 
you see even your v even the v is not clear what it the behavior of v when y goes to infinity so the v is not bounded when y goes to infinity um, so I mean, you have to design spaces the right way, okay? So one of the major, I mean, after you put analyticity, the problem is in Y, I will say, is more, it's not more, it's not really a problem of regularity, but more a problem in terms of decay. How U goes to capital, uh, how, how your U approaches this when Y goes to infinity. Okay, so that's uh, that's one that's one piece uh, that one type of works. Now it turns out that. I'm sorry, Nadia. Yeah. Uh, can I have a very short answer? Uh, here is the only thing I don't see clearly, and I want in Cafe San Martino, you said that there is an analytic limit. So what is the boundary condition of earlier? Because for the moment I don't see. Uh, it doesn't depend on the solution. So it, it's like a still an open uh, uh, unknown. No, okay. So, um, so, so yeah, yeah. San Martino and, uh, I mean, it, this is like the strongest result in terms of justifying the inviscid limit. Okay. So, still, the, limit, uh, the boundary condition is an open, uh, is an unknown here. No, okay. So, I, I can explain to you this. So you, you take you take you take Navier Stokes in this half space. Now you have Navier Stokes. You will solve Navier Stokes in some analytic regularity. And then you look at Euler. So Navier Stokes, Navier Stokes you can impose u nu equals zero on the boundary. Euler you impose, um, so you impose V Euler equals zero on the boundary. But U Euler is free. Okay, my, 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 vac my, my solution, I write it like this. Huh? This is the notation I'm using. Okay. So then I solve Euler. I solve Euler, I get my U Euler. So now I know what is U Euler. Now I come here and I solve Prantor with that guy. So then I have my solution of Prantor. Then what, what they are able to do, which is really uh, like very strong result, is that they are able to prove that this guy minus, uh, okay, so. I'm fine now. They justify the right. They they justify the decomposition. They really tell you, they really they are able to tell you that Navier Stokes, the solution of Navier Stokes behaves like Euler here. So this is my Navier Stokes behaves like and like Prandtl here. Yeah, it's okay. I just wanted. Yeah. So that's uh, that's that's their result here. Okay. Of course now. <coughs> um, in July, I'll speak about uh, invis I mean, justifying the inviscid limit with Prandtl. So um, their result is really like the strongest result in terms of conditions and also the strongest in terms of conclusion, right? Later on, uh, we started solving Prandtl in different spaces, less regular with monotonicity with this, with that. And uh, we, so then from those results, we want also to get inviscid limit, but then we get, okay, we get slightly weaker in terms of conclusion, but which is normal. Now, um, there is another result um, by Olenik. In the 60s, I think 62 maybe, she, prove, she proves that um, under monotonicity condition, you 
So this is my system P. P is well posed. It's well posed. So what does that mean? So you have to assume that U is monotone in Y. So let's say you can assume this condition. Um, for instance, for instance, I can put here a positive constant. I mean, just just to fix ideas, I can put this to be one. I can look at this problem, and um, I assume my initial data. So, so, so maybe let, let me write it down like this. I can take this problem with uh, I didn't impose the initial data. Some u zero. Okay. So I'm taking parental with some initial data. At zero, I am at zero. At infinity, I am at one. And what Olenik does, she assumes that u0 is um, dy of u0 is positive. OK. And then she proves. Um, local existence. OK, so here I'm not going into detail about uh, what type of regularity. Um, what she does, she uses uh, some holder type regularity. It's OK, I need maybe three, four derivatives to make it work. Um, plus holder regularity. Now, um, what's the idea of her proof? I'm not going to give a lot of detail. I mean, the whole idea here is to use a transformation which is called Croco transform. So the Croco transform So due to the fact that dyu is positive, okay, so for short time you will keep it, for short time you keep it. So the idea is to say instead of using, looking at using x, y as my variables, I will write the equation in terms of x, u. Okay. Now, so then instead of having my domain, which is the, half sp the upper half space, my domain here will be right, because u goes from 0 to 1. u goes from 0 to 1, and then you can make, uh, you can make a change of coordinate. And what she end up with, uh, she end up with some, some sort of degenerate parabolic equation, but without non-local terms. So the, the, the point in making this transformation is that you get rid of the non-local term. I'm not going to explain this because uh, more recently we have, um, and 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 for for a long period for a long time, uh, this was the only way we can, this was the only way we can prove uh, her result is that you do the Croco transform. How th the issue about the Croco transform is that it's not very suitable. If you want to look at inviscid limits, for instance, if you have in mind inviscid limit, uh, it's not very suitable because 
it's written in a strange variable set of variables um, so for a, for a period of time it was an interesting question to try to see if one can if one can um, prove local existence for parental for monotone data but in uh, without the croco transform so let me explain that how we can do that so that's uh, Okay, so how can we do it without Croco transform? So this is actually in, in a paper I have with my one of my students. I think yeah, a few years ago. Um, so this is a paper in uh, CPAM. I think 15 maybe. Okay, so let me explain the idea. And actually the idea is, is few lines. It's very simple. Um, and it uses, oh, I, I didn't keep the equation on omega. Oh, that was a mistake. Okay, I need to write down the equation on omega again. So, um, so we said that omega, omega, which is dyu, satisfies same equation. So um, I can take an x derivative here. So it didn't help, right? So I still have the same problem. Okay. So basically, I have this equation on omega with this problem. I have that equation on u, um, uh, this equation on omega x with this problem, that equation on u x with another problematic term. So two equations, each one of them has the problem. So how can we how can we get rid of the problem? So the problem appears in, in both equations. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's it, that's what we do, <laughs> exactly. So, so basically what we do, um, okay, so what we do is you take this equation and you multiply it by dy omega over, uh, sorry, um, over dyu. Okay. And you subtract. Okay. Now, um, when you do that, what do we get? Hmm? 
disappear. Yeah, the bad term disappear. Of course, now you get a lot, all bunch of commutators and stuff like that, but the bad term disappears. So that's that's more li that's the idea. Um, of course, now remember that what I have in mind is to do um, high order regularity. I'm not I'm not only interested in one derivative, so I'm interested in taking many derivatives. So. Um, so, so basically, what I'm explaining here, I can just write it down as dt. I can take s derivatives. Okay. I can take s derivatives. So, um, let me write. Le let me use this notation. Omega x s. This. I'm using this notation just uh, so that I can. So I'm taking S derivatives, S derivatives, um, S derivatives. So this term will also get S derivatives. Of course, now I have plus lower order terms. Yeah, so, so the lower order terms are OK, because like they are mixed derivatives and so on. So I mean, there are a lot of, but the, the, this is the important term. The only important term is this one, because this is the one that has s plus 1 derivative. So this is the bad, the real bad guy. This is OK, as I said, because it's a transport. This also is transport, so same here. We can, uh, I'll use the same notation, I put S, S, S. Here I have a term similar, but there are lower, I mean, but this is, I will call it like, it's more like lower order term. And here I have Vx, S, V, plus lower order terms. But you can see in both equations, this is the problem. That's the only problem. So then what we, what we do, we introduce the notation GS. GS is um, omega XS minus dy omega over omega, because dyu is omega of um, UXS. So, okay, if I write it in a more standard <coughs> notation, okay. Now, it's important, okay, we use the hypothesis that dy omega is positive, right? The dy omega so that we can divide by, by omega, right? So if, if you don't have the monotonicity, this, this, uh, this proof breaks down, doesn't work. Okay, so actually it turns out that this term is, uh, has even a nice way, I mean you can write it down in a, in a nice way because this is again, this is dyu, right? Um, this term, actually, you can write it down, if I remember well, is dx s u over omega dy. Same as for the heat equation, so so because it's a look at the derivative, this is natural Yeah, yeah, we can, yeah, you can write it with log also, yeah. So it's this, um, it's this quantity. So basically it means that I instead of looking at this guy, instead of looking at this guy, you divide it, you do this, and the equation on GS doesn't lose derivatives. 
the equation on GS. So now if you write down, then, then you can write down an equation on GS, you get BT of GS plus, so uh, we will keep the transport terms. I mean, this transport term with that one. So we have the transport term. Right? These are the only terms that, that lose derivative, but it's a transport plus uh, plus lower order. And of course, I mean, there are many, many commutators terms. I mean, like uh, a lot of commutators to study and so on. But at the end, this is the structure you get. And then this structure is good for energy estimate. Any questions about this? Okay, energy estimates. So, so you're working short time or long time? Short time. Okay. Short time. So it's local existence. And um, so, so what's happened for uh, so local existence blow up or not blow up? Uh, That's what we are now doing. All these questions about possible blow ups and so on. Yes. Yeah. But um, now this kind of like for Prentol, I mean there are. I, th I think I'm aware of, yeah, maybe two or three results about global existence for small data. So there are some, there are some, uh, I'll, yeah, and also there are global existence results for the, for the stationary problem. Okay, I didn't mention now the stationary problem, but I'll mention it. I mean, as of now, I'm just trying to do like the, I mean, there is another result of all any. Um, okay, so this is this is um, this is one type of um, result. So 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 you see, uh, if I if I try to put here the local existence results that we have. So we have one type which is analytic. Then the second type is monotone data. But with Sobolev. Um, so one, I mean, I mean now there are different extensions of these things. One extension, so there, wa there is a paper that uh, actually I wrote with my student and Vicol and Kokavika. Uh, I'm sorry, before you go, yes. uh, this I understand what, what you do, but S uh, would be fixed like what uh, at the end? Uh, maybe 10. Yeah, ten. yeah, or yeah 10. Okay. Okay. I mean less. I think, I think if I we optimize, I think 3 or four, 3 would be fine. Uh, okay, so here I explained how we do the the x derivatives. The y derivatives, you can take y derivatives also. I mean, in this result, I mean, here, as, as I presented it, it's just, uh, I'm just writing it as if it's only x derivatives, but you can take y derivatives, right? Doesn't hurt. You can take y derivatives, so you can propagate Sobolev in x and y. Okay, no, no, I just want yes. to so now, in terms of how, how these things can be extended, uh, like with Vicol and Kukavika, the four of us, we wrote another paper, um, which, okay, which says that you can have regions where you are analytic and regions where you are monotone, and you can match, you can match, you can put the two results together. I mean, it's not, it's not a big um, improvement, but, but somehow it tells you that you don't have necessarily to be monotone or, ana or, or analytic. You can, you can be in some region, in some region you are analytic, in some other region you are monotone. And you can even have uh, the monotonicity change. And the interesting things about this is that you can allow uh, 
like here the limit here is one for instance right my limit there is one so I can allow here a region where the, my limit here is one my limit here is minus one and then in the middle I am analytic right I, I analytic in X so here I am analytic in X here I am monotone here I am monotone and you can match okay this is one extension now <coughs> another extension but this I need to spend some time explaining it. There's a paper that I wrote with uh, David Gerard Barré where we do Gevray. But I need to, ex to motivate the Gevray regularity. Okay. Uh, Um, <coughs> actually, this result about Gevray, then there are a lot of other papers. Uh, many people wrote papers. Tong uh, Yong, uh, Zhang, I mean, many papers. I mean, uh, many Chinese actually wrote papers about uh, doing, uh, I mean, in different situations, impro also improving our result. I mean, we had. Jevray 7 fourth, so they went to Jevray 2. There are papers also doing the 3D. Um, but the, I think the best result now is, is a result that uh, David wrote with uh, Helge. So David with Helge, they have, I think, a very nice result where they do Jevray 2 without uh, structure assumptions. So in, in my paper with David, we have some structure assumptions, so we have to assume that the solution uh, start increasing then decreasing, or it can like, I mean, we have to have some condition on the critical points, and I mean, th th there is some assumption here. Uh, but okay, so after a lot of things, so there is a paper of David Gerard Varé with Helgo. Uh, Helgo, I mean, his name. I need to check the. Make sure that I'm not making a mistake with the. Okay. So, um, I'll try to motivate the Jovray regularity. I'll try to motivate the Jovray regularity. But uh, just before that, I mean, without going into, um, without spending too much time, let me let me talk a little bit about the um, the mono the stationary case. Since I'm talking here about monotonicity, the stationary case. So, um, so the stationary case, you just get rid of this term. Okay. And then you try to solve this. Okay. Now, can this, does this make sense? <coughs> and how, how can you solve it? Okay, the pressure can get it back. <coughs> this I can put back the Euler thing. course now I cannot impose initial data anymore so it turns out <coughs> this this system makes a lot of sense if if you choose u to be positive for instance and then <coughs> you 
you look at x equals 0, let's say. Now, and I look at u positive. And then it becomes, x will play the role of time. Now this becomes, this becomes uh, an evolution problem in x, actually. So it's an evolution problem in x. And the, the question you want to, so to do, you want to solve this till a, till a position x star. Right? So you start with, so your, your initial data, your initial data is to say u at x equals 0, y is some initial profile u0 of y. So this is a very, um, very precise question. Like you can try to, you can try to solve this. And again, um, <coughs> um, again, the the person who understood this first is Olenik. Um, around say maybe a few years later, 64 or 6, um, okay, I'm not sure about the dates, but um, so Olenik, and she has, I mean, th there is a book, she has a book about these problems. So uh, when u is positive, um, when u is positive, you can prove some local existence, right? So local existence, meaning that there exists some x star such that you can solve. Um, it turns out that um, you can also have both. You can assume this and also the monotonicity condition uh, that helps. And um, now one of the results is um, what we call the favorable pressure. If the f pressure is favorable, what does it mean the pressure is favorable? So the pressure is favorable meaning that it pushes you to stay positive. It pushes you to stay positive. So if you are in this condition, this condition with favorable pressure, So favorable pressure means that dxp is negative. Okay. Because then when you put it here, it becomes a positive term. So it, as you solve, it pushes you to, to stay positive. So under conditions like this, she can prove global existence. Global existence meaning that you can solve x till infinity. So of course, I mean, you need to put the right regularity and so on. Now, <coughs> her results, um, her results are based on another transformation, not the Croco, but uh, von Miles. There is another transformation that we call uh, von Miles. Um, it has similarity with the Croco transform um, that you apply. So, so is it possible to have it uh, on not start at uh, x equals zero but at minus infinity, let's say, uh, something like that? Here you just have it on half a quarter of the things. Mm -hmm. And also, do you have uh, a precise? Uh, Knowledge of what happens uh, as it x goes to infinity, so the limit is very kind of like behavior. Um. 
That's a good question. I'm not, uh, I mean, these are argument based on uh, maximum principle. Uh, yeah, I mean, like the. It looks to me like the traveling way. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I understand why, you're, why you are asking this question. Um, um, of course, now, um, right. So th this idea about, um, uh, uh, I mean, I will not even say traveling wave, but um, I mean, we have, we have these particular solutions, which are like, for instance, y squared over 2. But then it will not, uh, it doesn't match the, the boundary conditions. But that's, that will be the, um, the candidate. So for instance, um, Yeah, I mean, you're, you're no, no, but I mean, I mean, your question is very important. I mean, I think it's interesting. Uh, maybe I didn't think about it quite enough. Like for the problem as it is written, like what is the long time, what, what happens when x goes to infinity? Um, and whether we can solve from minus infinity. But from minus infinity, I mean, or, yeah, can we have solutions that are defined from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? That would be... Um, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course, I mean, all, all this, I mean, you have room in choosing this guy. This, this is a free uh, thing that you can do. Yeah, yeah, I, I, uh, I think I don't know. I don't know, but but the, just for um, I mean related related to your question, Frank. But um, is the fact that is the fact that let's say if you take um, if you take dxp to be minus one, for instance you take dxp to be minus 1, then you can look at, you can take u to be y squared over 2. This will be, this will be a solution. I mean, it doesn't depend on x. This can play the role, I mean, and actually we, uh, in, in, yeah, I mean, like, it is, it is, it's playing the role of some uh, solid honor or some, yeah. That's, that's my question. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, okay, but this is not, I mean, there's no x dependence here for this guy. Yeah, but you can have a boundary here. A <laughs> yeah, of course, more generally, you can put a y here. Anything like this. Yeah, so. Sorry, so do you mean u is negative y squared? Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, if, if I put a minus here, I need to put a minus here. Yeah, but then it doesn't. Uh, yeah, the, at, the, at the limit, it's not, uh, it's not that good. So, but in the, right, if I put a plus here, and I put a plus here, so that's the case where the pressure is not favorable, right? So this is more or less the setup of the paper I have with uh, Anlor. So with Anlor, that's uh, the, the, um, the blow up, proving the blow up and explaining how the blow up takes place at the point X star. Yeah, th this is one of the one of the objects we use. So we use this uh, the idea of this sort of soliton type. Okay, okay. So this is uh, this is about the stationary problem. Um, yeah. So so my plan my plan is to go back to the stationary problem in July and talk when I talk about the blow up results. So. Uh, so we have a blow up result here. 
with uh, and or. Um, okay. Okay. Now, now I want to I want to spend some time uh, explaining these Jouvry regularity results, right? So, um, I in what I explained here, uh, what I explained here, I did monotone data. I explained that for monotone data, we can do Sobolev. I still didn't explain why analytic data is necessary. It's, it's possible that, okay, I mean, in, uh, we had a way of, we had a way of cancelling th that problematic term if we have monotonicity, but I didn't explain that without monotonicity it doesn't work. <coughs> and it's even more that th there is a result um, so let's go to the I'm going to show you a result for this problem. So what is this problem? This is what we call, so I'm back to the time dependent problem. This is what we call the inviscid parental. Okay? This is inviscid parental. Um, Now, inviscid parental, <coughs> I mean, there are different ways of deriving it. I mean, it's not necessary that you start from Navier-Stokes, get parental, and then get rid of the viscosity. Uh, this model can also be derived from Euler. I mean, you can start from Euler, make some rescalings, and you can end up with this model. Okay. So now, uh, I have to th I have to remember what type of boundary conditions. Now, of course, now this model, um, yeah, so it's, uh, we, we impose the same boundary conditions. Uh, no, okay, I, I need to remember. Yeah, usually when we look at this problem, um, we don't impose boundary conditions at on U, only on V. Okay, so we don't need so this is how you write the problem, right? I don't have viscosity anymore. So only V equals zero on the boundary. Right? So I can solve this in the half space again, same. Okay. <coughs> I mean, this model also has um, has also some. Um, I mean, of course, usually we take it with zero. Yeah. No pressure. So this will be the inviscid. This will be the inviscid uh, parental. Okay. There is another model in the literature that we call um, hydrostatic Euler. So, so this, this usually people call it inviscid parental because it's written in the half space. Okay, it's written in the half space. So this is the inviscid parental. And what I'm going to show you is that this problem is actually well posed in Sobolev. This problem you can solve it in Sobolev. There is another model 
there is another model um, which is the so-called hydrostatic Euler, which is exactly the same equation. Uh, usually we put the pressure, but we take it between two plates. So the domain is this. And then we impose that V is equal to zero here, V equal zero here. V, uh, capital V, what I'm calling capital V. Okay. And here we, we put a pressure term. The pressure is not determined. You put, it's, it's, it's really, uh, so, so this is inviscid Prantol, this is hydrostatic Euler. So it's exactly the same equation, but the only difference is you add the pressure here is not determined and the pressure depends only on x it's um, it's like a Lagrange multiplier it's a Lagrange multiplier to the fact that you are imposing v equals zero at both boundaries here there's no pressure. I mean, like usually the model people write it like this. You can, I mean, if you want, you can add pressure, but, uh, but fixed coming from the Euler flow. For instance. It turns out that these two models, these two equations, even though they seem that they are the same, if you like think about them, they are the same. The only difference is boundary conditions. One is in the whole half space. The other one is between two plates. You are imposing boundary condition here and boundary condition here. <coughs> so if you think a little bit, you say, okay, should be the same, like in terms of well posedness and so on. It turns out that's not the case. This one, we can do it in Sobolev. Slightly, this one we can do it in Sobolev. This one, this one, no. This one has some uh, ill poseness result. <coughs> and um, actually with, my, with that same student Wong, we have a local existence for this one under some type of monotonicity assumption. We have to impose some sort of uh, convex profile. For convex profiles, uh, for convex profiles we can uh, we can prove local well poisonous for this. This was first done by Jan, Jan Brenier. <coughs> Jan Brenier has a result that is comparable to the Olenic type result. Uh, I mean, he works in Lagrangian coordinates and so on. Um, with my student Wong, with an idea similar to the one I mentioned here, very similar, some, some trick of combining derivatives and so on, we can prove local existence in Sobolev, but under some convexity assumption. Okay, so my, my goal here is more to explain a little bit things about this guy. And again, to insist on the fact that since this guy is solved, one can solve this guy in Sobolev, um, you add the viscosity, you say, okay, the viscosity is a good term, usually, so if the problem is well posed in Sobolev with viscosity, it should also be well posed, but that's not correct. So somehow you can see that for a, a, an equation like this, that one can solve in Sobolev. If you come and change a little bit the boundary, change the domain and impose this boundary condition, it's not uh, any more well posed in Sobolev. And same if you add viscosity, it's not any more well post in Sobolev, right? So it's very striking uh, in a sense. Okay, so let me try to explain how this one goes. Um, and I think, okay, so the, this sort of local well postness for this model, um, I think it exists in the physics literature. It goes back 
guess maybe to the 60s or something but but at least the the math paper is a paper of uh, Hong and Hunter and I'll, I'll explain it a little bit because um, the their result is useful for a blow-up result that I'm going to mention. So we have a blow-up result about Prentol. Um, not yet for Prentol. We have it for the inviscid Prentol for this model uh, with uh, Charles and uh, Tej Ghul. Uh, and it uses, it will use a little bit um, the, the, the method to solve this. Now, So the idea, I mean, the idea is very simple. It's just characteristics, right? So the idea is so um, so David with uh, Helga, they have also recently a, a different way of solving it. Uh, more based on energy, uh, which I think it's also has its own interest. Um, but but it's it's very it's very interesting that I mean this equation, uh, as it is written here, if you if you try to solve it by energy, by regular Sobolev energy. You cannot. I mean, uh, unless unless you 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 use you do their tricks. I mean, it's 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 not it's not completely trivial. I mean, it's, uh, I, I mean, again, it's really in the spirit of this sort of cancellation, but it's slightly more sophisticated. I mean, you have to cancel the right the bad guys in a way. Uh, but I mean, y you can see it immediately. Like if you start taking S derivatives. Like you will end up with equations similar to the one written there, but if you don't have uh, if you don't have monotonicity assumptions, I don't know what you can do with these terms, right? So, um, now the paper of Hong and Hunter um, is based on. Characteristics. So, uh, I mean, if you forget about this term, this is burgers, right? If you forget about this guy, this is burgers. Okay. So, this equation is a u. U is just transported. U is just transported. So. If I am able to write down characteristics, if I am able to write down my uh, system of characteristics, then you will be constant on those characteristics. Okay, so that's that's what we'll do. We we'll just write down. We we'll just write down the characteristics, right? So I need to understand. Um, okay, maybe. I'm going to make a change of notation. I'm going to make a change of notation. I'm, I'm just this I will write it small x. And this will I, I write it small y. OK. And OK, l l l let's write down everything small, OK? The only the only reason is that uh, right so everything is small and now um, capital X capital Y will be the Lagrangian coordinate okay, okay. so um, so I want to understand the characteristics so. I want to understand small x of t 
x y small y so of course x dot will be my u y dot will be v Make sense for everyone? So the interesting thing is that u is constant along the characteristics. u is constant along the characteristics. So, so, then, uh, so then this is a constant. This guy is a constant. It just depend on x, y, on the initial data. So, um, so then my x, my x becomes um, of, of course, normally I need to I, I need to say that x y t equals zero equal x y. So then my x will be capital X plus t u zero u zero is the initial data x y. It's like burgers. It's as if, I mean, this is exactly as if you are doing burgers. Okay, so uh, now comes an idea. How can we find uh, y? How can we find y? It's not trivial. Like y is not trivial because uh, v is non-local. V is non-local. Uh, so it's complicated. I mean, if you want to find y, it's not. So the idea, the interesting idea is that um, your vector field is, is divergence free. So your vector field is divergence free. So what that implies is that the transformation is volume preserving. Okay. So without, so without doing anything, you know that uh, the transformation capital XY gives x, y for each time, this transformation has to be volume preserving. Okay. So, so this is volume preserving. So then how do I determine small y? I don't need to solve the equation. But all I will say is that the determinant should be 1. So the determinant is 1. So it means that x, x, y, y minus okay. that's, um, that's the equation that we get now on, on y. That's, this is really the, 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 the idea. Because otherwise, I mean, if you, if you want to solve uh, y dot equal v, uh, it's a nightmare. I mean, you, can, you, you cannot. OK. OK, now, uh, how can we solve this equation now? I want to find y. I mean, at the end, I need to find y. I need to find y of t x y. This is what I'm. What, this is what I am after. I need to find this uh, this quantity. Um, of course, now this problem we are solving it on, on in the half space, right? And on the boundary, on the boundary v is zero. On the boundary v is zero, so 
Um, so actually, y on the boundary doesn't move, right? On the boundary, nothing moves. So on, on the boundary, it's 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 really burger. I mean, like on the boundary, you can you can just think about it as really burgers, right? Because um, okay. So so the idea the idea is to try to integrate something from the boundary, right? So. Um, so again, I mean, this is a transport equation because this guy is, is given. This guy is given. Okay, this guy is given. Uh, and okay, I can compute them. So x x is one plus t mu zero x x y. X Y is T U zero Y. Okay. So um, I can solve this as I can write this as I'm going to divide by by this factor. Uh, You assume a sign condition on zero <coughs> x. Okay, so that's that's true. So now um, this has again very similarity with burgers, right? So if you are solving burgers, if you are solving burgers, you need you can solve as long as this guy is positive, and when this guy becomes uh, when this guy becomes uh, zero, you get blow up. And that's exactly what the, that's what they say. The paper of Hong and Hunter, the paper of Hong and Hunter, they tell you that we can solve, we can solve, so, so that's their theorem of uh, Hong and Hunter. So you take uh, t less than uh, minus uh, one over minus u zero x the mag. Okay, whatever. Okay, let, let me not write it. Um, it turns out that in in what we are writing with uh, Charles and Tej, we can do slightly better. Actually, that, that will not be necessary the time of blow up. Um, and somehow the idea is the fact that you have two variables. OK, so, so uh, this is like the breakdown of the burgers way of thinking. But since now you have two variables, uh, it's possible that you get slightly, I mean, we have a better, a better way of, uh, uh, of justifying this using the, the second the, the fact that there is a y component also. Uh, and uh, okay, depending on how much time I can spend on about it, but uh, but anyway, so now this equation, how can we solve this equation? So there is another idea. There's another idea is that what are what are the characteristics of this equation? So if I put a zero here, Right? If I put a zero, what are the solutions? If I put a zero, the solution is just x equal constant, small x equal constant, right? So if I, if I take a zero here, small x equal constant is a solution. So, so basically, to solve this, I need to integrate this guy 
along a curve that starts from, um, from here, such that small x is a constant. So I, ju I just take the small x and go back. Okay. I mean, one has to convince himself, but uh, I, I, mean, I mean, it's easy. Like if x is a constant, you put it here, that, that will give you 0. Okay. So this gives us actually a formula. Maybe I'll just give you the formula that's. Um, so x equal constant, how do we, how do we write that? Uh, it means that your x equal constant, I think about it as um, as um, capital X is just a function of x, y, and t. So I, I'm just inverting that, that relation, right? So there I have small x as a function of capital X. I invert it, right? So you see here, I invert this. I think of capital X as a function that I call C of X, Y, T. Okay. So um, and then here and then here I'm integrating this uh, over a line where x is a, is a constant, so then I end up with the following formula. So I'm integrating this guy, y small, uh, capital Y, right? So capital X. So this is z, this is x of z. Okay. So again, you know what is your small x here. So so you know what is your small x. So this is a, n a number fixed. You call it x bar, right? That that small x there is is the small x of capital X y. So it's a constant. It's, it's, it's fixed. So then I look at the, the curve that goes back here, where my small x is constant. So this is where all these points have the same small x. And just you integrate, you integrate this quantity from zero to y. Okay, so that's that's all. Okay, now you have a formula. I mean, you can solve your characteristics. You get you have a formula. Okay, you plug it in, and that gives you the solution. I mean, you can now check back that this gives you the solution. Okay. Now. Um, of course, now all this suggests that maybe you can do something similar for Prentor. I was planning to, yeah, um, I, I went maybe very slow also today. I was planning to show you the um, ill posedness result for the linearized Prentor. So um, let me just take two, three minutes and mention this because. Um, I don't know whether I will have time next uh, in July to go back to this again, but um, so this is, this is an interesting paper by of uh, David with uh, Dorni. 
Să dea vie Gerard Vare with Dormi. Where they prove that uh, the linearized Prentor, so if you take Prentor, you linearize it around um, something which is non, not monotone. So you need a critical point. So you need a critical point. So you need a change of monotonicity of your profile. Um, they prove that um, the problem, the linearized problem is ill posed. So you can linearize, so you can, you can take a profile, um, what they call us of y. So of course, any profile like us of y, um, <coughs> I mean, modulo the viscosity term, I mean, for the, but if you take us of y for the, for the inviscid problem, us of y is just a solution of of your print of, of your inviscid printer, right? Uh, because the V is zero and the U U X U is zero, so nothing is happening. So now you can linearize around guys like this. What you get? What you get? You get the following uh, linearized equation. us prime because us is just a function of y okay so let's take this let's take the linearized prime all without pressure so you get this equation this is the profile that you are linearizing around and what they prove what they prove is that this linearized equation um, is ill-posed in, in, um, in Sobolev. And more precisely, what they prove that uh, you can get growth. OK, so, so of course, here, there's no x dependence. So you can do Fourier in x. You can do Fourier in x. And you can get growth, which are like exponential. Uh, OK, so. You can look at exponential ikx, okay, because it's, and then you can get growth which is of this nature. This is the type of growth. So you can get solutions which are exponential ikx times something like that, times something, some function of y, of course. But this is kind of growth that you get. So, of course, when you get growth like this, this is. This suggests that maybe you should do something in uh, Jevre regularity. Okay. And actually, the result, the, I mean, after a lot of work, the, result, the final result of uh, uh, David with Helger, they, they do the nonlinear problem in, in that same regularity. So they, they get really the, the critical type of regularity. OK. so. Okay, so again, the plan for the next two lectures, July 1st and July 3rd. So one of them, one of them, the plan will be to talk a little bit about inviscid limits with Prentol. So uh, there are, uh, there's a result that I have with David and Mayakawa, where we do uh, some justification of the limits I mean, uh, related to all this Jevre regularity. So I think I will spend some time maybe recalling the result of David with Dormi, okay. and then some of the development on how we justify the inviscid limit with, with Prantol but without analyticity. And then uh, the other lecture will be about uh, blow up. Blow up for the stationary problem and for the non-stationary problem. Okay. We'll see how much we can cover from all that.